If there's one science fiction model that rises above all others in terms of longevity and legacy, it's got to be AMT's 18-inch USS Enterprise from the original Star Trek TV series. It's been in production virtually non-stop since its debut in hobby stores over half a century ago, and like its big screen counterpart, it's seen numerous improvements and upgrades over five and a half decades. Along the way, this bit of late 60s merchandising also helped to cultivate the Star Trek kit bashing and aftermarket detail parts subculture that now defines the state of science fiction modeling. So let's slingshot around the sun and boldly go back in time to the swinging 60s and explore the development and convoluted history of this classic model kit. My name is Tim, you're watching Scale Icons, and this is a retrospective of AMT's Enterprise at 55. Right off the top, I want to give a special shout out to Jay Klodek and to Glenn Swanson, whose own research into the subject proved invaluable during the production of this video. Both Jay and Glenn have written a series of incredibly detailed essays on the history of the AMT Enterprise kits, and links to their articles over at culttvman.com are in the description below. Okay, the year was 1964 and writer Gene Roddenberry had just pitched an idea for a science fiction TV series to Desilu Studios. Sort of a wagon train to the stars, as he put it. The pitch landed him a three-year deal to produce a series focused on the crew of a futuristic starship exploring the galaxy. The SS Yorktown. Well, scripting still needed a lot of work, and the name of the ship would soon be changed to the Enterprise. Roddenberry's proposal was as ambitious as it was unprecedented. In fact, Writer-producer Gene Kuhn would later say that Gene created a totally new universe in developing the series. And this new universe would need a lot of design work to bring his vision of 23rd century space travel to life. In 1964, Desilu staff designer Peto Guzman was assigned as production designer for Star Trek's first pilot episode, The Cage. Working with his assistant, Walter Matt Jeffries, he did preliminary work on the interior sets and the exterior. However, shortly after starting, he left the series for personal reasons, leaving Jeffries to take over design responsibilities for many elements, including the Enterprise. Relying on his background in aviation and mechanical design, Jeffries incorporated what he called aircraft logic into his designs for the Enterprise. While it might seem obvious to all of us now, nobody in 1964 knew what a Federation starship was supposed to look like, and that included Roddenberry, who only provided Jeffries with some vague design parameters that essentially boiled down to three principles. About all he said that would help me along was uh, several don'ts, such as no flames, no fins, no rockets. He started out by experimenting with a variety of shapes and produced hundreds of designs and sketches, receiving feedback from Roddenberry throughout the process. After developing and discarding a variety of concepts, he ultimately imagined the ship's engines would be too powerful to be near the crew, so he decided to mount them away from the hull. Doing this opened the door to a conceptual path that eventually led to a very familiar configuration. But something was still missing. A spherical command module appealed to Jeffrey's aviation aesthetic because of its real-world utility as a pressure hull. He initially rejected anything disc-shaped, due to his concerns that it might look like a B-movie flying saucer. However, he eventually flattened that sphere into that instantly recognizable saucer shape we all know and love. It was during a visit to Jeffrey's workshop in August of 1964 when Roddenberry was drawn to an illustration of the Enterprise resembling what would eventually be its final configuration, as well as a small wooden maquette depicting the design. However, when Roddenberry picked it up by a string attached to it, the top heavy model flipped over. Roddenberry was apparently so taken with this upside-down orientation that Jeffries had to work hard to unsell this configuration, but he eventually convinced them that his original design looked much better. And with that, a screen icon was born. 
The first real miniature built from Jeffrey's drawings was an unlit 33-inch model, built by Richard Dayton of Desilu Studios in December of 1964. With this model approved, Desilu Studios then contracted the Volmer Jensen and the production model shop in Burbank, California to construct the actual filming miniature. Built under Dayton's supervision, the final model ended up being 11 feet long and weighed over 270 pounds. Some of the details on this model would later be slightly modified two more times in 1965 and in 1966. So when did the plastic model kit enter into this story? Well, to answer that question, we have to travel to Troy, Michigan, the headquarters of Aluminum Model Toys, better known to scale modelers as AMT. Even before the first episode aired in September 1966, advertising executive Stephen E. Whitfield brokered a deal with Desilu Studios for AMT to acquire the rights to manufacture model kits of the Enterprise, making this one of the show's first official licensed products. Before its involvement with Desilu Studios, AMT was best known for its range of 125th scale model car kits, so the choice of AMT to produce a model spaceship might seem like an odd one. It's worth remembering that the company had also established itself as a producer of models related to movie and television properties, such as its highly successful Munster coach and Dragula from the Munsters TV show. So in the fall of 1966, the scale modeling industry did something of a double take when AMT announced that it was about to begin tooling for the production of a model kit relating to Star Trek, a TV show that was barely midway through its first season. This was fairly unusual as the common practice for licensing at the time was to at least wait until the second season to make sure the show was actually a hit, and people would want to buy the merchandise. In fact, AMT had become involved in the production to such an extent that they would go on to play a significant role in keeping Star Trek on the air. But that's a story for another video. But by that summer, the kits were flying off the shelves, leading AMT to request both that the license be extended for at least one more year and that permission to sell internationally be granted. This would allow AMT to capitalize on its association with model producer Aurora, a course of action that would open the door to sales in Canada and the UK. Less than one year later, AMT had sold more than one million kits, knocking their own Munster coach out of the bestseller position. Not only was AMT happy, but the producers of Star Trek were thrilled as well. This memo from producer Bob Justman to Gene Roddenberry in October 1967 says it all. A million kits sold in one year. A record for the industry. Despite the show's flagging ratings, it had to be reassuring to know that the merchandise was still in demand. That first Enterprise kit consisted of about 25 parts molded in white styrene plastic, with the bridge and sensor domes molded in clear green. Once built, it would measure about 18 inches long, and was deemed to be about 1 650th scale. Those dimensions have never changed, but the original kit was quite different from later versions released over the years. For starters, this kit included a rudimentary lighting system for the upper and lower saucer domes. That's right, if we want to light our models now, we've got a shell out for expensive aftermarket lighting kits. Power was supplied by two AA batteries housed in the secondary hull. The deflector housing could be twisted to activate the lights, and to replace the batteries you could just pop the bottom off, hence the large seam visible in these photos. When it was first released, the kit also included a shuttle bay observation dome, but as we'll see in a few minutes, this feature would mysteriously disappear in the years to come. As for the warp engines, the Bassard collectors were molded in white, and the rear nacelle end caps more closely matched those found on the pilot versions of the on-screen Enterprise. However, attaching the warp engine pylons meant sliding them into the secondary hull and securing them with some flimsy locking tabs. This has led to a lot of crooked pylons and sagging engines, a problem that would plague this kit for years to come. The decals, or decals if you live in the USA, included markings for the Enterprise only, and in a font style that was only roughly similar to what was used on the actual studio model. A wobbly two-piece stand molded in clear plastic completed the kit. Unfortunately, the kit also featured a wildly out-of-scale raised sensory grid pattern on the top of the saucer. This infamous bit of detail remained in place for four decades, and added hours of extra sanding for modelers that wanted to achieve a smooth, screen-accurate appearance. 
There were also three anomalous dimples on the lower saucer, and I'll look at those more closely in a moment. In 1968, AMT released an improved version of the kit. Essentially the same as the original 1967 release, this one now featured clear orange domes for the Bassard collectors and two additional bulbs for the lighting kit to illuminate them. The kit saw several minor changes between 1968 and 1973, the most significant being the elimination of those lights in the Bassard collectors. During this period, some of the kits included the clear orange Bassards, while others shipped with opaque white Bassards. It's not really clear why this change was made. Some have suggested it was a cost-saving measure, while others believe it may have had something to do with the flimsy nature of those warp pylon connectors and the difficulty of trying to thread wires through them. In the early 70s, a fourth version was released that was notable for the complete elimination of the lighting kit itself. And with its removal, the secondary hull saw a complete redesign. Although it still generally used the same tooling as the original lighted kit, the internal tabs which held the batteries had been removed, and the hull pieces were now designed to be completely glued together. The main sensor dish and mount were a completely new tooling as well, as it was no longer required to act as a switch for the lighting system. The kit was revised once again, this time eliminating that notorious tab lock system for the warp pylons. It was replaced with stronger solid tabs, meant to be glued in place, and the addition of the new tooling helped to create a stronger, straighter alignment for the pylons and nacelles. Even better, that wobbly two-piece stand was replaced with a more stable three-piece cradle, a feature which would remain in use for the next 40 years. But perhaps the most obvious change had to be the inclusion of an entirely new decal sheet. Although it still used the less-than-accurate font, it now included markings for 14 different Constitution-class starships, including all the ships name-dropped in the series. This clever addition allowed modelers to build an entire fleet of starships, and would prove to be a boon for early kit bashers and scratch builders who could now build any Starfleet vessel they could imagine. In 1975, the kit saw a complete retooling so that it could fit into a smaller box. And in doing so, AMT made a number of changes that reflected its switch to new steel molds, and away from the original aluminum molds. The warp nacelles now featured a slight taper, making them more screen accurate. The one-piece Bassard collectors were reimagined as two-piece parts, though now slightly inaccurate, and the end caps were updated to finally depict those half-spheres on the studio model. The secondary hull was completely revised, with the warp engine attachment socket strengthened. However, the shuttle bay observation dome that had been present in all previous versions had mysteriously disappeared with this redesign and has never returned. Except for some subtle changes, the saucer is still very similar to the original versions, complete with its infamous raised sensor grid. The bridge superstructure, which never really resembled the teardrop shape of the filming miniature anyway, was changed slightly, resulting in even more of a lopsided hatbox shape than the previous version. The most mysterious feature on this newest version was the three dimples on the lower saucer, perfectly aligned port starboard and forward. These circular marks had actually been present on all the previous releases, but had been a few degrees out of alignment and weren't as deep as they were in this new version. These dimples have baffled modelers for decades, and there's no easy answer for their appearance. Were they supposed to be sensors? Hatches? Weapons? They weren't on the studio model, and they weren't on Jeffrey's blueprints either. One apocryphal account suggests the dimples on the original releases were there to help remove the parts from the molds. Something like ejector pin marks, just not flush with the saucer exterior. As this theory goes, when AMT retooled the kit for the smaller boxes, some well-meaning employee interpreted the dimples literally, realigned them, and they became a kit feature from that point forward. This all sounds a bit too convenient to me, so if you know why the dimples were really added, Leave a comment below and let's solve this five decade old mystery. In 1978, AMT was purchased by the Lesney Corporation, which at that time also owned the Matchbox Diecast Toy Company and its plastic model division. At the time of the sale, the theatrical release of Star Trek The Motion Picture was slated for Christmas of 1979 so demand for Star Trek merchandise had become higher than ever. To capitalize on this, Matchbox released a repop of the classic AMT Enterprise kit. 
other than molding it in a medium blue plastic, it was identical to AMT's most recent 1975 offering. In 1983, AMT was purchased again, this time by the Ertl Corporation. Known for their model kits, but also their die-cast metal toys, AMT moved its operation to the Ertl plant in Dyersville, Iowa. With the success of Star Trek in the movies and in TV reruns, demand for the classic Enterprise kit remained strong. So, in 1983, the kit was released again, with the box art modified ever so slightly to reflect that the company is now known as AMT Ertl. Although the kit tooling remained unchanged, the color of the styrene was switched to a light gray, and the clear green sensor domes were tinted to a smoke gray color instead. By the late 1980s, AMT Ertl's wide range of Star Trek models featured fully painted artwork on the kit boxes. In contrast, though, the classic Enterprise kit still featured that photographic box art that was virtually unchanged since 1968. To refresh the kit's look, a new painting was commissioned, and this newly repackaged model hit the shelves in 1989. But as it would turn out, this would be the final version of the kit ever released by AMT Ertl. Due to dwindling sales, as well as competition from its own larger and more accurate 22-inch cutaway Enterprise model, the decision was made to discontinue production of this classic kit in 1996. In 2007, AMT was purchased for the third time in as many decades, this time by Round 2 Models. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because Round 2 has cornered the market in breathing new life into vintage licensed model kits. The following year, Round 2 re-released the classic Enterprise kit in two variations that replicated the original legacy packaging from 1967. You could choose between a relatively inexpensive version in a standard cardboard box, or a more expensive, <clears throat> collectible metal tin that also included an art print. Speaking of which, if you are a collector, I've heard rumors that some unscrupulous vendors are passing the 2008 issue off as the original 1967 kit. Buyer beware. You can tell the difference as the new version doesn't have the As Seen on NBC TV printed on the box. True to form for Round 2, a number of minor changes were made to enhance the kit from previous AMT releases. Molded once again in white styrene, those infamous raised panel lines were finally removed from the upper saucer. The most welcome change is an entirely new decal sheet that is essentially a scaled up version of the extensive sheet offered in Round 2's own 1-1000 scale Enterprise kit. To mark Star Trek's 45th anniversary in 2011, AMT Round 2 released a special tie-in to the episode, The Tholian Web. This offering consisted of their classic Enterprise kit, but this time cast in the glow-in-the-dark green plastic, and it also included two small, in-scale Tholian Web spinner ships. Builders could now recreate the ghostly USS Defiant from that episode, or the Enterprise being menaced by the Tholian ships. But if you wanted to build the actual Tholian Web yourself, you're on your own. Four years later in 2015, Round 2 squeezed a bit more life out of the Enterprise by releasing it as a Build Together Kit. This new offering bundled their smaller 1-1000 scale Snap Together Enterprise model with the larger 1650 Classic Enterprise. The box art implied that dads could build one kit while their sons built another. Aside from the unintentional sexism implied in this marketing, it's not really clear which model was meant to be the more complex one intended for the grown-ups as the larger model had arguably been aimed at kids since its original release in 1967. Finally, Round 2 marked Star Trek's 50th anniversary in 2016 with a simple re-release of their 2008 kit in the cardboard box. Although no changes or special features were added, the boxes were wrapped in a special anniversary slipcover. To date, this has been the final release of the venerable model that first saw life in 1967. Despite the constant upgrades to the AMT kit over its 55-year lifespan, it's still far from an accurate representation of that 11-foot-long filming model. But I'd argue that the chronic accuracy issues paved the way for a cottage industry of aftermarket detail parts that not only allowed serious modelers to turn the kit into a reasonably accurate replica of the Enterprise, it also led to the growth of the Star Trek kit bashing subculture. The inclusion of that expanded decal sheet back in 1973 contributed to this, and demand for more accurate font likely led to the aftermarket custom decal industry we have today. 
even in spite of its many flaws, the kit could still be considered 100% screen accurate, at least for two ships in the original series. The AMT kit was actually used on screen to represent the battle-damaged USS Constellation in the episode The Doomsday Machine. Some of this footage was later recycled into the episode The Ultimate Computer, this time representing the USS Excalibur. After being in production for the better part of five decades, the classic 18-inch Enterprise probably has the longest continuous production history of any science fiction kit. In fact, there's a very good chance that you've built at least one of these classics yourself. And thinking back, I've probably built four or five since 1975 as well, culminating in this one I built in 2002. All of Round 2's classic Enterprise kits are still widely available in hobby shops and online, and even the later AMT kits can be found on the secondary market, though often at a steeper price than the superior Round 2 kits. Did you ever build AMT's classic Enterprise? What are your experiences with the kit? Comment below, I'd love to hear your thoughts. As always, if you have any suggestions for future videos, leave a comment below. Maybe, just maybe, I'll cover your topic and give you a shout out in the video for good measure. Don't forget to check out my other videos, and if you enjoyed this one, please show your appreciation by clicking that like button. And while you're at it, click the subscribe and notification bell as well so you never miss a single video. This is one way you can help a small channel like mine get noticed. You've been watching Scale Icons, and I'll see you soon at the workbench.